Hello and welcome. This is Jill bringing you a new episode of the Homeopathic Compendium podcast series. In each podcast you can listen to a short reading taken from the six volumes of the Homeopathic Compendium by David Little. The selected topics are designed to be interesting, informative and thought-provoking. Each one is just a brief glimpse of important themes that are discussed at much greater length in the compendium. To all our listeners, whether you are a student, a home prescriber or an experienced professional, we hope you enjoy these readings and find new ideas and inspiration for your practice of homeopathy. In this podcast, we are introducing the subject of constitution in homeopathic practice. Hippocrates taught the classical system of constitution and temperament more than 2,500 years ago, which makes it one of the oldest living traditions in Western medicine. The Hippocratic approach has had a profound influence on medical science, culture, and psychology, and is just as relevant today as it was in the days of the Greek naturalists. This is Compendium Talks, Episode 8. Constitution, the Hippocratic Approach. I am reading from Volume 5, Chapter 1, Constitutional Medicine. This is one of the free chapters featured on our website and provides a great introduction to the subject of constitutional treatment in homeopathy. Constitutional Medicine, Constitution and Terrain, the Hippocratic Corpus. Hippocrates was born on the island of Cos around 460 BC. In the apocryphal biography, the father of Western clinical medicine was born into a medical family that traced its lineage to Asclepius and Hercules. He placed great emphasis on the innate constitution of human beings because it intermingles with and conditions all responses to environment. In his work, The Nature of Man, Hippocrates discusses the makeup of the human constitution and how it interacts with nature as a whole. He recorded many of his clinical observations of the effects of environment, food and water on the human constitution in his famous work, Air, Water and Places. He followed the Pythagorean system of primordial homeomeries, which are the similar archetypal qualities that constitute all phenomena. The Pythagoreans call these unchanging roots the immaterial ether and the four physical elements composed of air, fire, water and earth. Hippocrates carefully avoided the intellectual debate about which one of the five elements was the primary power. He was more interested in the direct observation of the five elements and four humours in the constitution of his patients and their symptomatology. Hippocrates summed up much of his clinical philosophy in the first paragraph of Aphorisms of Hippocrates with the epigram Ho bios brachis, hede tecne macre, in Latin, ars longa, vita brevis. This statement may be translated as, art is long, life is brief. The old master wrote that it takes a long time to develop the true arts, while life passes quickly. Crisis is fleeting, experience is perilous, and decisions are difficult. The healing artist must do what is correct according to their ethics and understanding, as well as seek the cooperation of the patient, assistants, family and friends. They should do everything in their power to make the external circumstances harmonious so that the goal of true health may be accomplished. For these reasons, the practitioner should approach the study of homeopathy with sincerity and great perseverance. In the course of one's career, one will face many serious situations involving difficult decisions that can only be made properly with experience. The task is not easy, the situation multifaceted, and the responsibility great. Even when one conceives a plan, it is sometimes difficult to get the full assistance of the patient and their family. The healing artist should be willing to be with the patient and their family at difficult times, like birth, accidents, misfortunes, illness and death. They must be a combination of minister, counsellor and psychologist, as well as medical practitioner. Hippocrates was extremely practical in his approach to clinical medicine. 
he based his system on the observation of physis, the living power of nature found in the human organism. He was well aware of the healing properties of similars. In the Organon, Hanuman quoted Hippocrates' remarkable words taken from On the Place of the Things Which Regard Man as an example of ancient homeopathy. Quote, Disease is born of like things, and by the attack of like things, people are healed. Unquote. One of the most important teachings of Hippocrates is the doctrine of the etiological consolation and interdependent origin. Most disease states do not have one single isolated factor that can be called its sole cause. A mixture of susceptibility, virulence, exposure and time and circumstances is involved in most illnesses. Every human being possesses an innate predisposition and a certain amount of vitality that may be utilized in the form of adaptation energy. A person's essential susceptibility is based on the nature of their congenital constitution and natural temperament, as well as the amount of exposure to mental and physical stress at any given time. For this reason, Hippocrates taught that all diseases are constitutional in nature and only become local as the last resort to promote crisis. Throughout medical history, there has been a great debate about which comes first in importance, constitutional susceptibility or the pathogens that cause disease. This question was at the root of the disagreement between Klaus Barnett and Louis Pasteur. Barnett felt that the host constitution was a prime factor in disease, whereas Pasteur placed more importance on the role of the pathogen. Many people carry the Streptococcus bacteria, yet remain healthy under normal circumstances. If they are subjected to excessive mental or physical stress, many of them are likely to develop symptoms. Other individuals are very susceptible to Streptococcus and will become seriously ill if sufficiently exposed. Some people will never suffer from Streptococcus under any circumstances. What is the true cause of the disease then? Hippocrates placed the most emphasis in the congenital constitution, although he did not deny the influence of external stress factors and pathogens. Towards the end of Pasteur's life, he realized that Barnett's view was more correct. The fundamental cause of disease is so closely related to the predispositions of the constitution that it is impossible to ignore its primacy. Great physicians like Hippocrates Paracelsus and Hanuman were well aware of the importance of the constitution in the art of healing. Definition of constitution and temperament. Hippocrates introduced the tradition of studying the constitution and temperament into clinical medicine more than 2,500 years ago, which makes it one of the oldest living traditions in Western medicine. The term constitution is derived from the Latin noun constitutio, which means an arrangement or physical makeup, and the verb constituere, which means to establish or constitute. To constitute means to establish, to create, to set up, to form, to make up, to appoint, to give being to, etc. The term constitution may be defined as an act of creating or constituting the way something is made up or formed, the rules and regulations governing an organization, the principles, laws and personal rights on which a state is founded, the physical makeup, state of health, nature of the temperament, etc. When the term constitution is used specifically as a medical term, it relates to the makeup, nature, qualities, health and condition of the physical body and the mental temperament. Constitutional means that which affects the whole, the inherent makeup or structure of a person or thing, the way something is arranged in reference to its composition, construction or nature, that which relates to the physical and mental health or makeup. The term constitution is closely related to the word diathesis, 
which means an inherited or acquired constitutional disorder. Therefore, there may be inherited and acquired dispositions and diseases that affect the whole constitution. Hippocrates observed diseases from the vantage point of constitutional syndromes and their symptom picture rather than by pathological names alone. He carefully studied the physical constitution and its relationship to the mental disposition while recording the effects of stress, stress and pathogens on his patients. Through observation, Hippocrates recorded the predispositions and symptoms of his patients according to the most common biological types called the four temperaments. Hippocrates called these constitutions the choleric, phlegmatic, sanguine and melancholic temperaments. The essential qualities of the four temperaments and four humours are related to the four archetypal elements of earth, water, fire and air. The doctrine of the four temperaments is closely linked with the tradition of the vital airs and the humoral physiology. Modern science says that 80% of the human body is composed of humoral fluids which are the medium of life. A humour, in the classical context, is defined as a fluid of the animal body, especially the four that are considered in Hippocratic physiology to determine temperament or the disposition of mind. This is the basis of defining the word humour as the specific temperament or state of mind. This is the root of statements like, she is in bad humour, and he has no humour, or they are out of humour. The four major animal fluids are the bilious, bile, pituitous, clear fluids, sanguineous, red blood, and the atrobilious, black bile humours. Each of these four humours has a particular mood, atmosphere and quality. The earthy, yellow bile is angry, dry and hot. The watery, pituitous phlegm is weepy, moist and cold. The fiery sanguine blood is passionate, hot and moist. And the airy black atrobile is melancholic, cold and dry. A derangement of these humours produced by inner or outer causes generates a specific syndrome of signs, befallments and symptoms. Hippocrates also taught that diseases could be caused by disturbance of the three vital factors, the vital breath, air or wind, as well as heat and cold. Diseases of the vital airs produce nervous disorders, difficulty breathing, lack of coordination, alternating states, wandering pains, shaking, spasm, hiccups, constipation, belching, gas, etc. Diseases of cold produce chill, trembling, low body temperature, poor circulation, low energy, hypofunction, excess mucus, excess fluids, etc. Diseases of heat produce fever, thirst, dryness, plethora, excess energy, hyperfunction, rashes, pimples, boils, etc. Although the physiological concepts of the four humours and these, their factors may seem outdated, their related clinical pictures are still very accurate. This is because the ancient homeomeries are symbols for archetypal, archetypal energy patterns that have been observed for millennia. The genes of the paternal and maternal lineages and the natural qualities of the incarnate soul produce the innate constitution. Positive and negative hereditary tendencies contribute to the makeup and function of the inborn constitution and natural temperament. The inherent constitution and temperament compose a functional polarity that is closely aligned with inherited predispositions. These predispositions are natural tendencies that condition the desires and aversions of the individual and their reaction to their environment. The interdependence of the physical constitution and mental temperament 
is as inseparable as the vital force and the essential Wiesen. These are complementary opposites that make up one whole called a human being. The root derivation of the word temperament is the Latin tempem, temperamentum, which means a proportion mixture or state with respect to the combination or predominance of internal humors, qualities and climates. An innate temperament is an inborn constitution that permanently affects a person's psychological and physiological makeup and vital functions. The ancient Greeks taught that the four temperaments are associated with a preponderance of one of the four humours, i.e. yellow bile, phlegm, blood and black bile. These constitu constituents affect the state of the constitutional equilibrium, the nature of its predispositions and the makeup of the humoral types, i.e. the choleric, phlegmatic, sanguine and melancholic temperaments. Our generation has advanced the study of psychology related to homeopathy. But Hahnemann understood several aspects of constitution and temperament that are little known in contemporary practice. An investigation of the constitution and temperament is closely related to the study of inherited and acquired diatheses. A diathesis, the Greek word for disposition, is a particular condition or bodily habit that predisposes a person to a particular disease state. The term temperament has a number of definitions that were interrelated in the ancient healing arts. 1. Temperament is a proportioned mixture, a state with respect to a combination or predominance of specific qualities, internal constitution or natural state, mood and disposition, a type of physical and mental organization. 2. Temperament is a person's natural character or disposition that governs the way they behave, think and act. 3. When temperament is used classically, it refers to the four Hippocratic constituents, i.e. choleric, phlegmatic, sanguine and melancholic temperaments, which are based on mixtures of bile, phlegm, blood and black bile. 4. Temperament may be used to describe a sensitive, creative, excitable and emotional personality, i.e. to be temperamental. 5. The word temper comes from the Latin temperare, which means to mix in due proportion. When it is used as a noun, it means a mixture or balance of different or contrary qualities the constitution of the bodily temperament, a disposition, a habitual or actual frame of mind, characteristic state of the psyche, mood or humour. It also means a state of composure and self-control, even tempered, or the lack of composure and loss of control, losing one's temper, a state of anger and rage, bad tempered, or ill humor, irritability and peevishness, out of temper. The verb temper means to mix in due proportion, to modify by blending of a mixture, to moderate, to soften something, to make something less severe or rigid, to adjust, to tune, to attune, to adjust the mood or temperament, to bring to a favorable state of mind. 6. The word distemper, from the French destempre, to derange, means a mental or physical ailment. In Shakespearean English, this word was used to describe a person's unpleasant behavior, i.e. a distempered mind, or a liver condition from drinking, distempered liver, etc. Distemper is still used to describe a number of infectious diseases of animals, especially a particular viral infection in dogs. 7. Temperament is a musical term for a system of compromise in tuning that allows for the adjustment of the intervals between notes so an instrument can be played in any key. An equal temperament is a system of tuning 
in which notes are tuned in 12 equal intervals called the chromatic scale. An octave is a series of eight notes between the first and eighth note of a major or minor scale, e.g. from a lower C to a higher C. All of the above definitions have relevance to the healing arts. As a general term, temperament means the mood, disposition, demeanor, or the emotional tone of a person. When the word temperament is used specifically, it refers to the four major and twelve mixed constitutional temperaments. One must remember, however, that there are innate and temporary temperaments in the Hippocratic tradition. A temporary temperament is a transient state that affects the intellect, emotional disposition, mood, composure, and or the vital physiological functions. An innate temperament is the inborn makeup of the bodily constitution and mental character that conditions the structure of the psyche and soma. It is possible for an individual to have both innate and acquired mistunements of the constitutional temperament in layers that form complex disorders. The physical constitution and mental temperament is the meeting point of the collective prenatal or acquire in inherited and individual postnatal acquired aspects of human experience. In the ancient Greek tradition the terms constitution and temperament are interchangeable because of the intimate link between the physiological makeup and the innate personality. In physical terms this demonstrates the connection between the functions of the brain, nervous system and glandular secretions and how they affect the body and mind simultaneously. Following in the footsteps of Father Hippocrates, the great Paracelsus asked healers to return to the root of a problem if they wished to cure disease. Quote, no knowledge is perfect unless it includes an understanding of the origin, that is, the beginning. And as all men's diseases originate in his constitution, it is necessary that his constitution should be known if we wish to know his diseases. That's the end of our reading for this episode of Compendium Talks. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed it and found it interesting. Remember to look out for our next podcast. See you again soon. Bye-bye.